Hollywood is a constellation of megastars. This is the story of a visionary writer-director whose big bangs create those stars. He set Jennifer Garner on the path to superstardom and discovered Evangeline Lilly. Tonight you'll meet the man who keeps the secrets of Lost and learn the truth behind his latest special assignment. His work continues to shape our pop culture. J.J. Abrams, Hollywood icon. Action! J.J. dove in, and him and Tom have an excellent chemistry. I had a meeting with Tom Cruise. He was literally risking this franchise and this film on a first-time feature director. He's not really a first-time film director. He's got some directing chops. Find out why all of Hollywood is lining up to work with him. He deserves whatever is coming to him. I'm telling you, he's a major talent. J.J.'s like a new Steven Spielberg. That's where he's going. That's the type of director he is. How can you cover JJ in half an hour? I mean, what a man. No single artist has shaped entertainment more than this visionary creator, JJ Abrams, icon. Part of the Mission Impossible experience is that I got a chance to do it at all. I mean, I, I could go into a million different stories and details about you know things that were versions of dreams come true. It's like the thing that you always have like dreams. You think you know I could do that if I was given the chance. JJ got his shot at the big time, and he's making the most of it. Alias, Lost, and MI3 would come to change TV and movies. This is the story of an ambitious kid, born Jeffrey J. Abrams on June 27, 1966. When I was in kindergarten, I met this guy, Greg Grumberg. We're still best friends. JJ and I met um, in the sandbox in elementary school. He looked like a little Gabe Kaplan. He had like that, you know, the, the Jufro, you know, really big hair. JJ was born in New York. His father was working in radio and then got transferred out to LA. He's my brother. Working with him just gives me a level of, of comfort. It's not that I literally think he's my lucky charm. And whenever I'm working and he's, he's around, I feel like myself. No one else would talk to this little pudgy kid, so I did. And uh, I became his security guard from that point on. He insinuates himself into everything I do. I say, Greg, you're not going to be in this one. And he's like, no, I am. I can't get rid of him. You, uh, you like Italian food? I have a boyfriend. Yeah, me too. JJ was actually, he was brought up in a great uh, environment. His, his, both of his parents were incredibly creative. JJ had show business in his blood. Thank you so much. That's cool. His old man, Jerry Abrams, created TV's movie of the week. He was a lot like his dad. Same sort of very quick kind of, uh, you know, snappy way of talking. Here's mm -hmm. a little chip off the old block. I remember my father trying to push me away from being in the business because it's just such a hard business and so unpredictable. And, the odds of succeeding aren't very high, but the truth is, it was something that I, I, I knew if I didn't try, I would live all my life just wondering what would have happened. Jerry Abrams pushed his son from the business, but Hollywood pulled harder. I was eight, went to uh, Universal Studios. Do we have the monsters? How about your price? This was before computers ever had anything to do with the movies, but I remembered seeing how movies were made and just feeling like, this is it. Are you kidding me? This is the best thing I've ever seen. And wanting to do that. So it was really just falling in love with the magic of creating an effect and making people believe that it was real. Have you mastered this? No. Have you mastered anything? Uh. <laughs> As a kid, JJ fell in with a group of movie making friends who remain his collaborators today. Oh, mission uh. failed. Felicity, Alias, and Lost all have their roots in the friendships J.J. made before high school. I first met J.J. when he was about 12 years old. 
JJ at 12 is exactly how he is now. <laughs> he had all his energy, he knew everything, he was good at everything he did. We were both 13, we both made 8mm films. When I first met JJ, God, it's like, it's a nightmare, actually, to relive it. I remember he took me to his house and said, hey, look at this movie I did. I go, that's cool. And he goes, hey, come over here, look at this. Hey, here's a song I can play at the piano. There was a public access channel out here in Los Angeles. This guy was interviewing this kid, and this kid has all, the, all these movies on, and we thought, how do I get my movies on the show? We all bonded over our questionable social life and our love of movies. So I called the guy up, and he said, you should meet JJ, and we became fast friends, and we started making films together. We hit it off immediately. I wrote this script. This guy was sort of paranoid about death, and he's on his way to the airport. Who's that? And he looks out the window as they're taking him to the airport, and he sees that a plane has crashed into the front lawn. A student film of Matt's called Mr. Petrified Forest, where it was actually Matt's house at the time. And we were like, well, how, how the hell are we going to get an airplane on the front lawn. And I said, yeah, but I don't think I could do it. How would I ever pull that off? And quintessential JJ was, oh, well, no, 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 no. If you want to shoot that moment, I'll build you a plane. And in turn, he built it. He actually built it out of balsa wood. And sure enough, he showed up with the plane. It was classic, JJ. The burning wreckage was an omen of what was to come for JJ. But not before finishing high school and heading off to college. We actually met in um, April of uh, 1984. We'd both been accepted at Sarah Lawrence. So we did sort of hit it off right away. During my senior year, I ran into this girl who I'd known, uh, Jill Mazursky. Her father is Paul Mazursky. Jill and I had an idea for a movie called Philofax, which later became Taking Care of Business. Paul decided he wanted to produce it, and they made it with Charles Grodin and Jim Belushi, and Arthur Hiller directed it. So right away, there were these great people involved in something that JJ had his name attached to. Abrams was just warming up. When Icons returns, he hooks up with nice girl Felicity and turns bad girl Sydney Bristow loose on primetime. JJ was beginning to leave his mark on television, but his biggest ideas are still to come on Icons. You're watching Icons, JJ Abrams, only on G4. We now return to Icons, JJ Abrams, only on G4. Between the release of MI3 and his high-profile TV shows, Hollywood creator J.J. Abrams has found himself squarely in the spotlight. Things were much quieter on the day back in 1990 when he sold his first comedy script, Taking Care of Business. That Monday, the Writers Guild started a strike, and I got to finish college and come back to L.A. and move in with my best friend, Greg Grunberg. Am I too early? They were roommates in the Fairfax district in Los Angeles. I remember it was decorated with all antique radios. There are a lot of recurring characters in J.J.'s life. Well, J.J. was cranking scripts out, constantly writing, calls me at 3 in the morning. Can I read you a scene? I'm like, can I get some sleep? So J.J. and I went to this Chinese restaurant, and we sat down and we're talking about sort of new ideas, and he was talking about this idea that he had for a movie, which was about this young woman who... Who is graduating high school and has a big crush on this boy. He writes this one beautiful thing in her yearbook, and she changes her entire college career to follow that one nice thought across the country and hope that she will run into him again. Felicity came about, I didn't know if it was going to be a movie or a TV show, but then Matt Reeves and I developed it as a TV show. Creating Felicity was boot camp for the daily grind on JJ's horizon. The production of Alias. was in, in many ways a response to Felicity because Felicity didn't have bad guys. I was hungry for bad guys. To face his new bad guys, JJ created a character that looked like a Bond girl but moved like Bond. JJ totally has a knack for creating female characters. He always had Jennifer in his mind. He saw something in her and she was just totally in the right mindset to take all this on and he completely embraced it. Other than JJ, she was probably the hardest working person on the alias. You know, the fight was so intense, I almost don't remember it. Sometimes that happens on this show. Something is just so consuming or so physical or so emotional that it's just like, oh my God, did that really happen? And feeling like... 
see Jennifer garnered right on the cusp of that stardom. She was great. She was just really professional. He just lives and breathes it when he's doing a project. It's everything to him, I think. He can do two or three things at the same time. When we were finishing Alias, the pilot, he was creating the title sequence on his computer at the same time as he was cutting it. And then he started working on the music at the same time as he was doing it. It was like, that's just incredible to me. We actually started with him on Alias. We have a very vivid memory of sitting outside his office. He came out and he looked like he was 12. He decided to take Alias and it very much became a family show disguised as a spy thriller. And cut. It was a big transition in terms of the kinds of things they were used to filming. Because suddenly we had special effects, stunts, car stunts. Suddenly we had to do a lot of visual effects. We're nowhere near done. JJ learned to work fast on Alias, a critical skill he would need for his next big thing. Before Lost was the biggest show in the world, it was the riskiest and most expensive TV pilot ever shot. JJ was arguing with ABC. No, no, this is a series. All right, everyone gets wet, everyone gets sick. There's mud, lights blow up, the cameras go down. Just ahead on Icons, the Lost pilot becomes a battle against the clock, the network, and the elements for JJ Abrams. Watching Icons, J.J. Abrams, only on G4. We now return to Icons, J.J. Abrams, only on G4. The successes of Felicity and Alias turned Carrie Russell and Jennifer Garner into stars and moved creator J.J. Abrams to the top of ABC's speed dial. The head of ABC at the time called me and said, I want to do a show about people who survived a plane crash and land on an island. So I met with this guy, Damon Lindelof, who I'd never met before. The first time I actually saw J.J. Abrams, him and my wife was like, you should so get, go say hi, you know? You watch Alias every week, you're obsessed with the guy, and I was like, no, 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 I can't, I can't talk to him. Abrams had never met Lindelof when ABC paired them together for Lost. The moment I met him, I just knew this was a guy who I had to work with. As we came in, we shook hands, and J.J. basically sort of talked for about 20 minutes about all the reasons that this wouldn't work as a show. The next step was a torrent of emails that night about how exciting the meeting was and how this show might just work, and because the network was so desperate for it. ABC didn't just want Lost, they wanted it fast. We had less than three months to write it, cast it, shoot it, cut it, and turn it into a two-hour pilot. Abrams began to assemble an eclectic cast, a mixture of seasoned vets and complete unknowns. Evangeline Lilly, I think it was like, literally Lost is like her first speaking role. She had done like a couple extra work and I think she played like a corpse in two movies or something. And so that's extraordinary to get that kind of dynamic of some people that this is their first big break. The network resisted JJ's only choice to shoot the Lost pilot, his childhood buddy, Larry Fong. But he really fought hard to get Larry to be allowed to shoot the pilot of Lost. There was a huge resistance to him at the studio. I had to meet the executives. I have not done a lot of TV. It was a very difficult interview. I was sweating. We see nothing in your resume that, that says you could possibly pull off something like Lost. All I know is I've known JJ for 25 years. We have a common vocabulary. I know what he likes. I have photographic skills, and I think I could help him make his vision. JJ fought and won his staff and cast battles with the network, but the hardest part lay ahead, executing a two-hour pilot on a challenging location. So the whole thing happened incredibly quickly with very little time to second guess our instincts. Just to get the plane from the Mojave Desert in California to the north shore of Oahu, scouted the island and there's the, we knew that the terrain would be really, really hard to shoot in. Our first day, there was torrential rain pour, flooded out, real rain. Half the rain you see in that show is real. <laughs> you know? So the first week was, was really, really challenging. The conditions were terrible. Like, we were shooting in the jungle, and every bug that's ever been created, right in my crotch, okay? And I'm, and I'm in the cockpit, <clears throat> no pun intended, of this plane, and it's just, it's like awful. <laughs> I mean, usually these things take years, or they'll take like at least at least a year just to get up to the point where you're 
casting people. By completing the two-hour lost pilot from scratch, in an astonishing three months, J.J. Abrams did the impossible, which was the direction his life was about to take. J.J. will probably kill me for it, but we were down in Hawaii basically sort of shooting the pilot, and constantly he was getting distracted by cell phone calls. He basically just said, and not in sort of a snotty way, he's like, ah, I have to call Tom back. And he's like, Tom Cruise was stalking J.J. to come and do this job. Oh, yeah, well, pff, uh, Tom Cruise, got to get him off the phone. What a nuisance. When Icons returns, Tom Cruise finally gets his man. With J.J. Abrams calling the shots, the two get down to Mission Impossible's bullets, broads, and bombs. J.J. Abrams had become a no-risk gamble for TV executives, and the Felicity alias and lost trifecta was about to pay out big time for J.J. He was the only person surprised to learn what was in the cards for him. The fact that Tom Cruise and, and Paul Wagner gave me the opportunity to do this movie, it was just laughable and inconceivable to me. Like, if I were in their position, would I have done this? I can't imagine. He orchestrated that we spend the whole first day shooting in the boat. Myself, Tom, Ving, Maggie, the team. What he wanted to do was send us out onto the Tiber and let us break the ice with each other. JJ just sat on land behind the monitor and just, like, watched it all unfold. He is still the kid in front of the black and white TV watching it for the first time. MI3 cost almost $200 million, the highest priced movie ever by a first time director. But JJ couldn't buy the shots he needed at the Vatican. So he made like Ethan Hunt and stole them. You can't actually have a camera or a crew anywhere within the Vatican, but you can't close off the street, so they had to hide the camera in one of the little gift shops. We set up a fake set. And we thought, what would really get Italian men not looking at Mission Impossible? And we couldn't think of anything but 22 of the most beautiful women we could find, wearing almost nothing. And they just all sat around with sort of like glasses of champagne. And suddenly, it was like thousands surrounding them. And there we were off, shooting Mission Impossible, with nobody looking down our camera lens, because everybody was over there checking out the, you know, Bella Donnas. It was like guerrilla filmmaking all of a sudden, and yet you're making, you know, this massive movie. It's not that different from when you're making student films and you don't have a permit to shoot on the street. Yeah, we just hope we don't go to hell, you know, shooting into the Vatican, you know, <laughs> without permission. J.J. Dove in, and him and Tom have an excellent chemistry. He's in tune with people, and I think he really tapped into something with Mission 3. Abrams works as hard as anyone in show business, but his projects are always in the backseat. Family has to come first. It's the most important thing. I thought, how is this whole marriage and father thing going to work out for him? But it has. Katie, I love. And his children are amazing. But like everything he does, you know, he's, he's pulled it off again. Because it's so easy, as you know, to get sucked into your job. And little by little, you know, you're home later and later. You leave earlier and earlier. And all of a sudden, your kids are going off to another school. And you're like, I miss that life. And that's a disaster. I want my kids to be happy. I don't care what they end up doing. My wife and I see things in both of our older kids that are sort of familiar in some ways to what we went through when we were young. J.J. Abrams writes, directs, scores, and will oversee the creation of a new lost video game. What's next for Hollywood's Renaissance Man? I'm very interested in writing uh, a play, and I actually have um, some thoughts about a mu musical. It's like my favorite hobby is, is music, so I'd love to go and do something that, that eases that a little bit more. Paramount was so happy with MI3 that they offered J.J. the captain's chair on their most important franchise. We've all uh, decided that guys who are, are working on the movie with me, that it's way too early to start talking about uh, Star Trek. And we definitely do not look at it as Star Trek 11. You can say certain names like Brookheimer or Cameron or Lucas or Spielberg, and he is not Abrams. He is J.J. What's up? That's me. That's what you call him when you meet him. He's never Mr. Abrams. He's that guy. <laughs> oh, God, you're such a jerk. <laughs> My inspiration comes from him. More so for him as a man and as a father and as a husband than as a producer and a fellow partner. And I just am in awe of everything he does.
I mean, he is a genius. He really is. I mean, I, I know people throw that word around, but he cares very much about his family and his friends. Now, this is something where I get my ass kicked. <laughs> Despite all the success that he's had, JJ is still connected to his roots. And part of him loves the idea of getting to do something that is, to many people, a dream. He kind of uses everything that's around him, whether it's his friend, Greg Rumberg, who he's known since kindergarten, or Matt Reeves, or me. JJ's a great guy. He's just wonderful. And if you can be jealous in a good way of somebody and their talent and their success, and if that is a label of an icon, yes, JJ's an icon. But if not, then he's still the little Gabe Kaplan running around kicking sand in my face. And cut. Is that good for you guys? Uh, I believe that's a wrap. J.J. Abrams has earned his fame, fortune, family, and friends. Without missing a single step, he's made TV shows and films that have thrilled audiences and dodged critics' bullets. Whatever endeavor J.J. Abrams targets next, expect magic. You watch it, you see it? You see it? Right. Right. That's all I got, it's nothing. Wait, hold on. To hear more music from the artists featured on Icons, go to g4tv.com/icons.